this session will be recorded um, and we will send out the link to the recording afterwards um, after the event has concluded. So my name is Je Jenna Pontius. I'm the reference and instruction librarian at the Riverside County Law Library. Um, I also coordinate programs like this uh, for the public, mostly all virtual, well, all virtual now because the library still remains closed to the public. So I'm in, excited to have Andrea K. Shoup, a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. After serving as deputy district attorney for the San Diego District Attorney's Office, Andrea now focuses exclusively on estate planning, trust administration, probate administration, and business succession planning. Andrea is committed to helping her clients protect their property, their family, and their legacy. And Andrea is based in Temecula. And during her presentation, I will be monitoring, mon monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions and they um, have to deal with the information that she's presenting on, I will um, wait for a break and ask her the questions. Or if not, I can hold them all to the end. So we do want to have some break times throughout the presentation that we're able to ask questions. And please use the chat um, for anything else, technical issues, and Andrea will have portions where she's going to ask you to put um, your responses into the chat. So without further ado, here we are with Andrea on estate planning beyond the basics. Thank you so much, Jenna. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today about estate planning. Um, just uh, a real quick, it's just some housekeeping. I want to make sure that you can all hear me. So if you could just type a Y or a yes in the chat, please um, make sure that you let me know. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Wanda, for letting me know that. Um, okay, so awesome. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Teresa. Great. So now that I know you can hear me, so what we're going to be talking about today is um, a lot about estate planning, okay, and, and what that really means. So what you're going to discover today, thank you, Liz, um, is uh, over the, our next time together, really about how to preserve family harmony, right, about um, to avoid family fighting. We're going to also learn how to prevent the state from inheriting from you should something unexpected occur. We're also going to learn um, how to simplify things for your family in the event of something unexpected occurring. We're also going to learn about um, how to protect your legacy should something happen to you and make sure that you can minimize any estate tax liability. So we want to make sure that we keep peace of mind in knowing that everything has been set up uh, for ourselves, for our family, should the unexpected occur. So that's what you're going to discover during our time together here today. So um, let's see here. Uh, this is for you if you are sick and tired of getting wrong information. We hear so much bad information out there. So if you're sick and tired of getting wrong information, this is for you. If you're worried that things aren't going to be done right, we're going to make some bad choices, bad decisions. Um, this is also for you. And if you're frustrated that you still haven't gotten your affairs in order, you haven't done this, this is still on your to-do list, this is for you. And if you want to make sure that you, um, your legacy is protected. You are in the right spot, okay? We're going to be answering those questions and helping you move closer to, to having those things um, happen. So I just want you to imagine, we're going to be talking about um, what you want to achieve and during our time together. So imagine if you had a magic wand, okay? And with that magic wand, you could have peace of mind knowing that your family's protected. You have peace of mind knowing that it was done right and done well. And you have peace of mind knowing that it was just done and what to do. That is what we're going to be talking about and doing today. Um, so it's important that you get this information. Um, I'm going to be talking about it in a few different perspectives, especially um, to achieve these things. We have to know what not to do. So some of the pitfalls and the mistakes that we really want to avoid when we're setting things up for ourselves and for our family. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So I'm just going to tell you just a little bit about myself and um, a little bit about my story. So um, as Jenna mentioned, I was working at the district attorney's office. So I was a felony trial prosecutor uh, down in San Diego and having a great time. And my husband was active duty Marine and he was having a great time. And then we met this little guy, Matthew, Matthew, um, our first son. 
And all of a sudden the what ifs in life started playing in my head, right? What if my husband didn't return from that deployment? What if something happened to me? What happens to our baby? And all the mommy blogs at the time said, told me I need to get an estate plan. I need an estate plan. Um, so I, I looked, I'm like, okay, let me figure out, well, first, what the heck is an estate plan? Um, and second, how do I get one? Um, so I, when I figured out all that I had to do to protect my family, what I really learned was how bad things are when we haven't planned. One of my biggest fears was my son would end up in, um, like in foster care, in temporary care, because something happened to me, happened to my husband, and there was nothing in place, and my parents couldn't couldn't take my baby for me, you know, um, so that was a big fear of mine. So I, I realized and discovered what I needed to do to protect ourselves, but also what happens when we aren't protected. So um, I'm often asked, okay, well, what is estate planning? What the heck does that actually mean? Well, one definition that I have found is that it's the legally structuring the management and future disposition of current and future assets. Huh? What the heck does that mean? What it really means is, and what we're really concerned about are two things. We're concerned about two major things. One, legal access, two, legal instructions. So if you, um, Jenna, I believe sent out an email with a handout. So if you have that handout and if you wanna follow along, go ahead and take that out. And there's some blanks for you to fill some stuff in. Anything that um, has something for you to fill in, it's gonna be bolded and underlined, okay? I'll point it out as we go along as well. So two things with estate planning that we're concerned about is legal access, legal instructions, we need to know, okay, if something happens to you, something happens to us, who steps in? Who has that legal access, legal authority to act on our behalf? And number two, what are they gonna do when they're acting? We need legal instructions. We, not just to, to tell them what to do, but to enforce what they're going to do. We wanna make sure that they're legal instructions so we know they are going to follow our wishes and what we've detailed out. So state planning's worried about those two things, legal access, legal instructions. Okay, some of the goals with this term of estate planning when we're talking about how, um, how people are going to get that legal access and legal instructions is first and foremost, maintaining control. Okay, we want to make sure that we maintain control of ourselves and our property and what happens with our family. Okay, we want to maintain control. Second, we want to decide for ourselves who's going to step in for us. Who's going to step in and make decisions for us? We, well, we want to decide that. We don't want to leave it to some judge who's never met our family, right? We want to make sure that we decide who steps in for us. We also want to make sure we avoid court. I can tell you, I spent nearly six years in the district attorney's office. I've been doing this, gosh, for eight years and going into probate court. Ain't nothing good happen in court, right? We want to stay out of court. So we want to make sure that we avoid court as much as we can. We also, and that's another one of those avoid court. So that's another one of those terms if you're following along with that handout. It's bolded and it's underlined. Anyways, um, we also want to avoid unnecessary delays because if we have to go to court, it's going to take time. No matter what, whenever we file a petition, we need a court hearing date, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It takes a little while and we wanna avoid those unnecessary delays. We also wanna make sure that we avoid unnecessary expenses and taxes. Okay, those are our goals. Again, that's another one of those terms for that, that handout if you're using it. These are our goals when we talk about estate planning. So estate planning, again, legal access, legal control. Well, the way we do that is, is setting up documents, okay? We've heard of wills and trusts and powers of attorney. Well, it's, that, it's all of them because they all operate just a little bit differently from themselves. So the, the way we achieve this estate plan and we meet these goals is with these documents, with a will, a trust, power of attorney. I'm going to talk about those documents in just a few minutes, but that's how we, we achieve these goals is with those documents. 
All right. So let's see. Um, one, as I mentioned before, I'm going to tell you how to, to achieve these goals, but also I'm going to take it from the perspective of what do we want to avoid? How, what mistakes do we want to make sure we don't make when we're doing this? So the first uh, mistake that I see happen all the time, um, the, the most common mistake that I see is having no plan, right? So um, if we have not planned for ourselves, you know, we have no plan. We don't have an estate plan. We don't have a will. We don't have a trust. We don't have any of that. Um, but, and I, I will tell you, it's actually a misconception. We think we don't have a plan, but we do. Our plan isn't contained in the probate code. Right? So um, the, the fine folks in, in Sacramento, um, whatever your opinion of them may be, we're not gonna get into that, but the fine folks up there, have, they have created an estate plan for us and it's all contained in the probate code. So even though we, we think we don't have a plan, we think we haven't planned, we actually do have a plan and it's contained in the probate code. And that, that plan really is the government plan. Okay, that we default to the government plan when we haven't made choices for ourselves and we haven't done anything for us. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see happen. So I'm often asked, okay, Andrea, I get that. Um, I, don't, I don't think I want the government plan, but what is it? Can you tell me what that is? What do I default to? Absolutely. So um, the government plan includes a few different things. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, um, Two major topics that we talk about today is one is when we pass away and two, when we become incapacitated. Now I know those aren't the most um, exciting or fun topics to talk about, but it's important that we plan for it and that we're aware of what happens because we never know what life brings us. So the two major times that we're talking about is what happens when we pass away and what happens if we become incapacitated. When I say incapacitated, what I mean is when we're unable to manage our financial affairs. Okay, when we're unable to, to manage for ourselves. Now that could be the result of an illness, uh, maybe a stroke, maybe a car accident, maybe just the slow decline of age. There's many different times and reasons we may become incapacitated, but that's usually when um, what leads to us being incapacitated. So those are the two times I'm talking about when we pass away and then when we, when we become incapacitated. So the government plan, what is it? Well, first it involves probate. Anyone here probate? Anybody's been through it? I'm, I hope your family hasn't been, but anybody has experience? If you can, if you could just put a P for probate in the chat, just so I have an idea of um, what we've had to, to go through and encounter. Let me check the chat. Um, Okay, it doesn't seem like anybody's had to go through probate. Well, I, I'm glad for you and your family because, um, oh, okay, sorry, I got a probate veteran in here. Um, yeah, you know, it's not a, a fun process, I will say, um, and it's nothing that we want to have to go through. And if you've gone through it, you will know it's something we want to avoid. So um, that is the government plan for us when we haven't planned for ourselves and we passed away. So probate is a court procedure. It is the process of transferring assets from one person to somebody else after that person's passed away. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the process of that in just a few minutes, but let me um, tell you an example of somebody who had to go through probate. So if anybody remembers Mr. Howard Hughes, so he um, passed away um, a few decades ago now. Uh, he did not have a will and he actually had built quite a massive um, amount of wealth. He was in the aeronautics industry and he had said to many people throughout his life um, that he never wanted his distant relatives to ever inherit from him. He had, he had no children and his parents had already passed um, and so forth. So he had made it clear he didn't want his distant relatives to inherit from him. However, he did no planning. He did not have a will. And even though he had, during his lifetime, created these amazing foundations for medical research and development, he and that's where he wanted his wealth to go to, he hadn't made a plan to do that. So the government had a plan for him. And yes, it included about 34 years of probate. Could you imagine? 34 years. Anyways, that's a whole different story. But 
the result of that probate was over 1,100 people benefited from his estate, including all those distant relatives he never wanted to inherit. It is so important, despite our wishes and our wants, if we haven't done a plan for ourselves and we have no plan, which is a government plan, then it, our, um, our wishes can't be honored because there's nothing that, that a judge or anybody can use to follow. So probate, that is the government plan. Incapacitation. If we um, are, become incapacitated and we haven't planned for ourselves, so the probate code has some provisions in here and it includes a conservatorship. So what's a conservatorship, you ask? Well, it's when we are incapacitated, as I've mentioned, and a judge appoints someone else to act for us. So it's clear we're not able to act for ourselves for any number of reasons. Maybe we've had a stroke and we can't manage. Well, then a court will appoint someone to step in and manage for us. They'll uh, make sure that our care is being paid for, our bills are being paid. Now, I've talked about a judge and a court. Remember, nothing good happens in court. That conservatorship process is not a fun process. Okay, it takes quite a while. Um, I'd say about four to six months before it's in place, give or take. Now with all the COVID shutdowns, it actually took uh, much longer than that, unfortunately. Um, and the courts, especially Riverside courts are actually pretty good in all the counties around us. Um, Riverside's pretty much the fastest, thankfully. Um, but it still takes quite a while to be able to get those uh, that conservatorship in place when you need it. And when somebody's had a stroke and you need access to funds and make sure you're able to make decisions four to six months is a long time now I'm told many times well you know I'm married my husband can take care of things for me right well not all the time and it depends on what's going on I had a very um, sad situation I talked to a husband and wife a few years ago and they had wanted to do their estate plan and I said sure of course I can help you um, but then they but they were going on a trip to Arizona to visit family and they were going to do it when they come back and I said absolutely I'm here just give me a call well the wife did give me a call but she called me and she was a little frantic um, her husband had had a stroke and she wanted to know if I could do a power of attorney very quickly and go to the hospital to have him sign it. I said, absolutely. I'm, I'm more than happy to help you with that. And I started asking more questions. I said, well, tell me, um, will, he, will he understand what we're doing? Because we need him to understand so that he can sign the power of attorney. She said, Andrea, he doesn't even remember who I am. He doesn't understand. It, uh, it broke my heart. I said, I am so sorry. If he doesn't understand, he can't sign a power of attorney. It, it, he can't do that. And she said, but you don't understand. If I don't get this power of attorney, um, I can't finish the refinance of our house that we started. And if I don't finish that refinance, I'm going to have to sell my house. And it broke my heart because I had to explain to her, I, I, I'm sorry, the same way he can't sign the power of attorney, the same way they're not letting him sign the documents for the refinance, they're not going to let him sign documents to sell the house either. Unfortunately, that wife spent the last seven months of her husband's life trying to get a conservatorship over him. It was awful. So nothing is automatic. It, it, there's some thoughts that it's automatic. It's not. And yes, even husbands and wives sometimes have to have conservatorships over each other. So um, that unfortunately ends up being the government plan when we have it planned for ourselves. So mistake number one was having no plan. Um, I'm now going to talk about mistake number two. Mistake number two is only having a will. Now you might ask me, well, but a will is an estate planning document. Isn't that a good thing? Well, depends on what you want to do because a will contains instructions to a judge. Okay, wills contain instructions to a judge. Again, those, there's that bold and highlighted, or I'm sorry, underlined if you're following along with your handout. So a will contains instructions to a judge. So if we're in front of a judge, where are we? We're in court and we're in probate court where we don't want to be. So um, remember, nothing good happens in probate. So a will is not enough to avoid probate. Now you might tell me, well, I'm, I'm my mom's only daughter. There's no one else. I'm going to get everything. If she has a simple will that says, give it all to her daughter, I'm her only daughter. Why do I have to go through probate? I get it. That's a valid question. Unfortunately, 
because that's what the probate code says. And lawyers and judges follow what the probate code says, right? We have to follow the law. And the law says that even if you have a will, even if no one's contesting anything, no one's fighting about anything, it could be clear as day what happens if you just have a will and you have to go through probate, we have to go through probate. So what is probate? As I mentioned before, it is a court process. It's a court procedure. It's a very lengthy procedure. I would say on average, most probates take about 18 to 24 months, and those are ones that are uncontested. Okay, that means nobody's fighting, nobody's arguing. Um, there, it's just going along its way. It takes about 18 to 24 months. It's a very public process. So things that we think of as pretty private information, um, where we bank, you know, the, the assets we had when we passed, our bank account numbers, our bank account balances, it's all public record. In fact, we have to file an inventory of everyone's assets that lists out everything, bank accounts, bank account numbers, bank account balances, in an inventory, which is um, public record record. It's also a very costly process. So I will tell you, probate is expensive. Um, statutory probate fees are based on the gross estate value of, a, of an estate. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, let's say we have a house. The gross estate value is the value of the house. So let's just say the house is worth $500,000. But you tell me, well, but I have a mortgage of $400,000. So really, that's only $100,000. Nope, it's still $500,000. When I say gross, it means we're not worried about the mortgage or any uh, liabilities. Okay, so we're just looking at the estate value. So if we look um, and the probate fees are based on percentages. So here's a chart and it shows, let's just look at that $500,000 home, some you know modest retirement funds, modest uh, bank accounts, modest personal property. Uh, probate fees exceed $26,000. And that's just for the sheer honor and privilege of going through that probate process. That's a lot of money. And that is just for that process. Um, I actually had a situation where a, um, a lady, uh, she was the only daughter of her mom who passed away. And the only asset that needed to pass was a home. And unfortunately, the daughter had to come up with those funds out of pocket because the mom didn't have any other bank accounts or retirement accounts available. That was um, very difficult and very hard on the daughter to come up with the costs and the fees necessary to go through that probate. So we want to avoid it. Probate's bad, right? We don't want the um, we don't want the government plan uh, that is not for us. We want to avoid probate. Well then. How do we pro uh, avoid probate? Well, that is a great question. So that is where um, we wanna make sure that we've planned. And that is um, a big part of why we're here. And we wanna plan when we can still plan. I um, just recently heard from a client, I had, well, I heard from his family. Um, I had helped him with his mom's trust administration. Mom had a trust and I helped him transfer her assets after uh, she had passed away. And it was a very simple process. It took us maybe a few, um, maybe two or three months. Um, very, very simple and straightforward. Well, she, um, he, him and I had talked about him doing his own estate plan. He's like, yes, absolutely, Andrea. I'm going to get to that. Um, give me a call in a few months. And so we'd call him in a few months. Give me a call in another few months. And, um, you know, he was busy. And, and that's, of course, uh, we all get busy. Unfortunately, I just heard from um, his dad that he passed away this past weekend. And it's heartbreaking and it's heart-wrenching um, because, unfortunately, now, because he didn't have an estate plan, we're going to have to do a full probate to um, administer his estate. And that that's um, such a difficult reality for family who's already suffering a loss to have to go through that court process. So that's why we want to avoid probate. So the way we do it is usually with a trust, right? Um, we've heard of a trust. Uh, we've heard of a revocable trust, a living trust, a family trust. What's a trust and why is it so special? So a trust is, um, well, let me explain it this way. Let me tell you what a will is. So we all basically know what a will is. A will basically says, here's my stuff. And here's who I want to get my stuff after I passed away. And here's my executor, the person I want in charge of everything to make sure my stuff goes to who I want it to go to. But wills go through probate, right? A trust, on the other hand, says, here's my stuff. And here's who I want to receive my stuff after I pass. And here's my trustee, kind of like that executor, who I want to make sure that who I, um, my wishes are 
are um, honored and, and fulfilled. A trust also talks about how we manage property during our lifetime, so in case we get incapacitated. And a properly drafted, a properly funded trust will completely avoid probate. That's why you hear about it so much. In California, if you own real property, you just got to have a trust. That's how we avoid that probate process, okay? That's why you hear about it so much. That's why people talk about it. You know, it's not just for, you know, um, you know, like um, a, a trust fund baby, right? Th that is not what we're talking about at all. You, we don't have to have millions and millions and millions of dollars in the bank to have a trust. If you own real property, meaning your home, even if you co-own that home with the bank, you still need to have a trust. So let me talk a little bit about trust, especially roles in a trust, okay? There are three major roles in any trust. Um, and they, they, are, let's see, there, there's three job or three roles with three jobs, okay? First one is a trust maker. Sometimes it's called a trustor, a grantor, a settlor. I like calling it a trust maker because it's very descriptive. It's the creator of the trust, the maker of the trust, okay? Again, bold and underlined if you're following along with that handout. Um, it is, let's see, number six. Um, so the creator of the trust, that's the trust maker. Um, that's generally us, right? Um, if we're creating one for our own family, then we're the creator of our own trust. You would be the creator of your own trust. The second job is the job of a trustee. The job of the trustee is to manage and make decisions for the trust. So they um, open up bank accounts, they write checks, they buy and sell real property, anything that really needs a signature, that's the job of the trustee. Okay, during your entire lifetime, as long as you're alive and well and want to, you're your own trustee. The third role is the role of the beneficiary. That's who actually gets the benefit of the trust. They get to live in the house and enjoy the money in the bank account. So um, you are your own beneficiary throughout your whole life. Only after you pass does someone else become your beneficiary. I, um, I showed you a picture of my one son, Matthew. I now have four kids. Um, so my beneficiaries would be my four kids, but only after I pass away. Right? They don't have any right or um, to my property now. As far as trustee, I'm my own trustee now. There's nobody who, um, it, I don't have to answer to anybody of how I spend my money. I'm not, no limitations on how I spend my money. Um, I can write checks however I want, whatever I want. Don't tell my husband that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm still in control. So I'm my own trustee only after I pass away or I become incapacitated to someone else step in as trustee, okay? The way I see, and they, um, I'm often asked, well, does the beneficiary have to be the trustee and vice versa? Absolutely not. Two very different roles with two very different jobs. The way I see it as is the trustee's job is to write the check. Beneficiary's job is to cash the check, okay? And they don't have to be the same person. They can be, but they don't have to be. All right, when we're talking about that beneficiary, they receive distributions according to your wishes, okay? You get to decide. As I mentioned, I have four little ones. Guess what they're not gonna get when they turn 18? Any amount of money, right? I, I can't do that. Um, you know, if I have life insurance, could you, could you imagine um, if somebody, you know, if I don't know if anybody has minor children, but if you do have minor children, imagine if they sold your home and they had the proceeds um, available to them when they're 18, let's just say $100,000 in the hands of an 18 year old. That's pretty scary, right? What does that look like? It's probably shiny red and fast. It's nothing we want to have happen for our kids. So um, we can set up well. We want to make sure we encourage education, have funds available for college, but not just for, you know, doing nothing. Um, we don't want it to... Um, to mess with their uh, work ethic. Uh, maybe we want to step it out. Maybe they get some when they're 25, 30, you know, there's all kinds of different things. I will mention it's absolutely necessary, necessary to have a special trust if you have any special needs beneficiaries. My brother-in-law has special needs. And so we had to set up a special needs trust for him. He receives government benefits, uh, which provides some income, but most importantly, it provides health insurance for him. 
And if he were to come off of that health insurance, it would be very, very detrimental to him to change doctors, change prescriptions, everything. So it's very important that we maintain those benefits. There, with a special needs trust, you're able to maintain those government benefits and leave an inheritance available to supplement what isn't already provided. So it's very important. If you have special needs beneficiaries, you've got to have a special needs trust. Okay. And as I mentioned before, a properly drafted, properly funded trust will completely avoid probate. And that's the name of the game. We want to stay out of court, right? So um, that is why you hear about a trust and why it's so important. So I've said properly drafted. Now, properly funded. Well, what the heck do I mean about that? So common estate planning mistake number three is not funding your trust. Well, what does that mean? to fund your trust. This is what it means. It means that your trust can only control trust property. Well, how does something become trust property? That's the funding part. So your trustee can only control that trust property. So imagine we have our bank accounts, we have our house and our stuff. We actually have to have a change in how things are owned. Very simply at the bank, well, instead of our name, so instead of my name as Andrea Shoup on my bank account, it now says Andrea Shoup, trustee of Andrea Shoup's trust. It's very simple. I have, that is the funding. I now have my bank account reflect my trust so that the trust can control that asset. Once the bank account says Andrea Shoup, trustee of Andrea Shoup's trust, then it is funded into the trust. That's also exceptionally important for the house. So when you have your home, so when we purchase a home, what do we get? We get a grant deed. That's our, that's our title paperwork. That's the proof that we own our house, right? Well, usually the house will come in our individual name. My house came in Andrea Shoup's name right? Well, I had to make sure I got that into my trust. So we have to actually do a trust transfer deed. There must be a trans tra trust transfer deed that says, you know, as it says here, it goes from Dan Smith and Jane Smith, husband and wife, to Dan Smith and Jane Smith, trustees of the Smith Family Trust. It is so very important that that is done. If not, the house is not in the trust, okay? And that is a, a common thing that I see. Um, I actually had a situation where a gentleman came in and he said, Andrea, I need some help. My husband, or, no, it wasn't husband. My dad passed away and I need to now administer his trust. Don't worry, it's a, we, there's a trust. I said, okay, great. Was the house in the name of the trust? And the son said, I'm, yeah, I'm sure it was. So we pulled the title from the county recorder's office and we found that this had not happened. There was no trust transfer deed. It still was in, let's just say, Dan Smith's name. Okay, well, um, we looked at the trust binder that he had and there was a post-it note on the trust document. It was from the attorney and it said, don't forget to transfer your house. Ugh. Unfortunately, that's how it was left. There was a post-it note telling uh, Dan uh, to transfer the house. Dan either didn't see it or probably didn't know how to transfer the house into the name of his trust. It is so important. Make sure that this step is not missed when you have your trust set up. It's got to be done. Um, you also have to be careful if it is done, which is great. If you ever refinance your house, it's, it uh, many times has to get put back into the trust name, okay? A lot of lenders will take it out of the trust, but they won't put it back in. So you got to make sure that that happens. Also, and this is something I see a lot. If you're a business owner, you've got to, got to make sure that your business is included in your trust. The business must be transferred to your trust. There's also, especially if you have an S Corp, um, there are certain S Corp provisions that must be in your trust so you don't lose your S Corp election. So I know that's talking um, a lot of taxes right there, but it's so important. There are great benefits, you know, if your CPA says so, about having an S Corp. We don't want to lose that S Corp election by not planning for your business properly. So you've got to make sure you've got a special business trust to do that. So um, estate planning mistake number four is not updating your trust, right? Okay, great. We got it done and we got it done 30 years ago. 
well, probably a lot's changed in 30 years. We got to make sure that we don't have an old plan. We don't need old documents. So unfortunately, that happened to Mr. Heath Ledger. So he had set up his estate plan and he had left everything to his parents and his sister. And that's completely fine. He can do what he wants. But he did not... Um, updated after his baby girl was born. I think she was about two years old when he passed away unexpectedly and it, his estate plan had not been updated. And while the family was able to reach a settlement and figure things out, that was only after about two, two and a half years of court hearings and procedures and so forth that could have, should have been completely avoided. So you've got to make sure you update your plan. Um, we need to make sure we review our plan when anything major occurs on our life. Well, what's major? If there's a birth, if there's a death, if there's a marriage, if there's a divorce, if we buy or sell a home, if we have a new business, we've got to, got to, got to make sure that your estate plan is up to date. Also, we've got to make sure that if we have done it 30, years ago, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, that it's up, it's looked at and reviewed to make sure that the law hasn't changed so much that it needs to be updated because of changes in the laws. So make sure you review it and you update it when anything major occurs that changes what, what you want to see happen. I talked to a gentleman um, a few years ago and when we were going through his estate plan, I said, oh, um, I see here, you know, Fred Miller is named as your trustee. Who's Fred? He's like, Fred's still in here? Oh my gosh, that was my college roommate. No, 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 take him out. So you'd be surprised what we find in there. It's so important. Make sure you open up that binder and see what's in there every few years and make sure it's still up to date. All right, next mistake that I um, see is not having a power of attorney. Well, what's a power of attorney? A power of attorney um, allows someone to make decisions for you. Okay, and there's two different types of powers of attorney. One is financial decisions, one's for medical decisions. I'll talk about medical decisions in a minute. So a power of attorney gives power, right, to someone else to make decisions for us. And when we talk about financial decisions, it allows them to make financial decisions for us. And you can say, wait, Andrea, we just talked all about a trust and we were just learned that trustees are gonna step in for us if we become incapacitated. Are you talking out of both sides of your mouth? No, I am not it is absolutely right. And they're both right. And let me explain. So remember um, all of our assets, all of our stuff. Well, think about all of the transactions, not just our stuff, but all the transactions we might need to do. So in addition to our stuff, our house, our bank accounts, our car, we have taxes, we have retirement accounts, we have our cell phone carriers. Well, our trustee handles our assets, our stuff, the power of attorney handles the other transactions. Cell phone carriers, well, that's not an asset. Our cell phone bill, right? Um, our other utility bills, that's where a power of attorney comes into play. Retirement accounts, that's one I'm gonna put an asterisk on. It cannot be a trust asset. Um, we have to plan for those appropriately, but during our lifetime, just because of IRS regulations, it cannot be a trust asset. We need a power of attorney so that, let's just say that stroke did occur we want to make sure someone could take our required minimum distributions out for us, our you know, RMDs, uh, once we turn 72 and a half. So that comes with a power of attorney. Paying taxes, well, that's not an asset. And it's, it's usually you know, a, a very big and painful liability, right? So that's something, again, your trustee doesn't do. It is the power of attorney who does it. So we have to have both. Usually when where the power of attorney, where the trust ends, the power of attorney steps in and vice versa, right? So you have to have both. The different tools that I'm talking about, they, they're just that. They're different types of tools. It's like, um, you know, and I'm often asked, well, do I need a trust or a power of attorney? Well, it depends on what you're doing. Are we selling your home or are we taking a distribution from your retirement account? It's like, um, what's better, a screwdriver or a hammer? Well, it depends. Do we have a screw or a nail, right? Um, what, what do we need? Um, there are different type of tools that work differently and one's not better than the other. It really depends on the transaction and what that need is. All right, so um, it's important to have a power of attorney for financial decisions. I will say, I wanna mention, a power of attorney extinguishes upon passing, okay? When the person dies, the power of, 
power of attorney dies with them. So we have to make sure that uh, we don't rely on that for anything to happen after passing. Once that person's passed away, the power of attorney no longer works. Well, it's also important to have a power of attorney for medical decisions. That's an advanced healthcare directive. Now, with all the illnesses and sicknesses and COVID and everything going on, you can imagine that this became more important than ever just as a community um, to, that we experience. So it's so very important that we have someone designated to be able to make medical decisions for us and make our wishes known regarding what kind of treatment we want, what, what kind of end of life decisions we have, our wishes regarding life support, you know, feeding tubes, hydration tubes, ventilation tubes, and the, so, and the such. So make sure that you have a power of attorney for medical decisions. That's the Advanced Healthcare Directive. And Jenna, I'm just gonna check in with you. I, I can't see the chat, so you let me know. If we have any questions, let me know. Are we good? We don't have any questions. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, another mis common mistake that I see, mistake number six is not planning for a blended family. Well, what's a blended family? Your um, PowerPoint is not showing anymore oh, though. Oops, let me see. Technical difficulties, I love it. Okay, give me a second. Sorry about that, everyone. Share, yeah. It's back up now. Awesome, perfect. Okay, blended family. So uh, mistake number six is not planning for a blended family. What is a blended family? It's the Brady Bunch, right? We got his kids, we got her kids, we got our kids. So we have to make sure we plan for blended families and because we wanna make sure we avoid inadvertent disinheritance. Well, what the heck does that mean and how do I accidentally disinherit someone? Well, let's, let's imagine this. Let's say husband and wife, they've been married for years. They've been married for 40 years. And everything that they have acquired during their marriage, their home, retirement accounts, bank accounts, it's all family assets, right? It's both of theirs. Husband has his son, wife has her daughter, both from other relationships. Um, but to the four of them, they're like the four pack. They love each other and they've um, been raised together over the past 40 years. And uh, you know, they still have Sunday dinner every night together, get together for holidays, the whole shebang. Well, if we, they haven't planned well, what happens? What's that government plan that occurs if husband passes away? Even though they have the family assets after husband passes, it essentially breaks in half. We have husband share and we have wife share, okay? Well, what happens to husband share? It goes to wife and now we just have wife share. Well, that's fine. That's exactly what husband would want. It's her money too. She, you know, helped create it over the last 40 years and she needs it in her uh, retirement and for her life to live off of and everything. So that's exactly what he would want to have happen. Good job, government plan. But here's where it gets interesting. So now what happens if wife passes? Where does everything go? It goes to her children because his kids were not the natural heirs of wife, right? There's, it was a stepson, not you know, legally adopted. Stepchildren, unfortunately, don't generally inherit, okay? They're not natural heirs. It goes 100% to wife's daughter, even though wife had wanted both children to, to inherit. Well, that's not good. Well, what happens, let's change it up a little bit. Let's say after husband passed, everything goes to wife and that's still fine but wife remarries and then wife passes away, what happens? It goes to new husband and his kids. If they have it planned properly, that's exactly what would occur. Now wife's kids don't receive anything. Husband's kids didn't receive anything. That is unfortunately how we result in inadvertent disinheritance. I will tell you, it happens a lot. It happens much more frequently and um, than we would ever like to believe or, or for it to occur. And um, if I was to poll everybody, I would suspect at least one or two people would have um, kind of that horror story of, oh yeah, that happened to my uncle or, oh yeah, that happened to my dad or, oh yeah, that happened to my neighbor, right? It happens all the time, unfortunately. So we've got to plan for inadvertent disinheritance. 
All right. Um, common mistake that I see is informal planning. So uh, what is informal planning? Princess Diana, she actually, um, she had a trust and the bulk of her estate went to her two sons. Give me just a second. And they um, received her estate, but she also left a letter of wishes. And in this letter of wishes, she had made certain gifts of personal property, some jewelry, mementos, and so forth to her goddaughters, that these were items that she wanted them to have. Unfortunately, the judge said, I'm sorry, your le the letters of wishes was informal planning and her wishes were not honored. As clear as the wishes would have been to most anybody reading it or looking at it, it was informal planning and wishes were not honored. So as much as we tell people exactly what we want to have happen, we, we explain it to them and so forth, the, those um, types of um, pinky swear promises, right? They just can't be honored and they can't be followed by a judge, unfortunately. And the um, eighth, let's see, common mistake that I see is DIY planning, right? A DIY planning, it is, um, everywhere. And uh, many of the websites, you know, Susie Orman, LegalZoom, Rocket Lawyer, Google, they all give us this um, idea that, okay, we can do this ourselves. And oh, it just makes me shudder because I have seen these go terribly, terribly wrong. Um, I, I'm helping a, an estate right now. This lady, she had a will and she had a trust Unfortunately, she, I don't, and I don't know what website she used to get these documents, but um, they were not well done. We've, she's been past, gosh, two and a half years now. We've been in court that whole time. We're still not done with the probate um, because of all these different issues. Once we're done with the probate, then we're going to have to go and administer the trust to finally have all of our wish, her wishes done. Um, it, DIY planning just ends up with some really unexpected results. I, I talked to a, um, two sons a few years back. Their mom had done DIY planning for her will. And in her will, she had properly planned for her uh, potted plants who would water the potted plants um, if she wasn't able to and who would receive them up, upon her passing. And then um, she left everything else, two or no, three pieces of real property to her older son, so that he could take care of his younger brothers. Now, these were um, gentlemen in their 50s and 60s. I think older son was in his early 60s. And the judge who was reading it basically stopped reading after it said to older son, because the judge said, I don't know what take care of his two younger brothers means. So stopped reading after to oldest son and he got everything. The two younger sons didn't get anything. And you would think, well, gosh, you would think he'd share, right? He did not. Um, the two younger sons saw his family photos on Facebook that year. He took his trip, his family on a trip to Orlando, Florida um, for a ver very nice uh, vacation on their inheritance, unfortunately. So a um, one other example, I'll just, I'll bore you with one other example of DIY planning, um, Chief Justice Warren Berger. So he was the Chief Justice of our US Supreme Court. Um, no doubt, a brilliant legal mind. Like this guy knew the law, but he did not understand estate planning. And he actually wrote his own will. I think it was all of 84 pages long. And um, it again contained instructions to a judge because it was a will. And it resulted in his son and his daughter paying over $450,000 in completely avoidable estate taxes and probate fees. Um, so everybody, everybody needs proper estate planning, even other lawyers, right? We got to make sure that it is done well, it's done right. DIY planning gives us an aura of protection that just isn't there. And you don't even know it's wrong till it's too late. And frankly, most people don't ever know it's wrong because it's their family who's um, handling it after they've passed away. So DIY planning is not a good idea. We definitely don't want to do that. So just as, as a recap, our common mistakes um, that I see all the time is having no plan, only having a will, not funding your trust, 
not updating your trust, not having a power of attorney, not planning for a blended family, informal planning, and then do-it-yourself planning. So the next thing I wanna talk briefly about is death taxes, okay? What the heck are death taxes? Usually death taxes are, um, uh, estate taxes. So I, I'm asked all the time, oh my gosh, I don't want the state to inherit half my property after I pass. We've got to fix that. We've got to avoid that. One way that that happens is through probate costs and fees, which we've already talked about how to avoid that. As far as death taxes, um, as estate taxes, on the federal side, we have a federal exemption limit of 11.58 million, which means you can pass $11.58 million with no estate taxes. Anything above that has estate taxes. Now, most people, um, most of us don't have that problem, right? That we have um, 11.58 million or above and then joined can, um, as a couple, uh, 23 point something million dollars. Um, it's usually not something that we're concerned about or planning for now. However, um, that higher limit just went into effect a few years ago, and we don't know what those limits will be in the future. So it's always something to be aware of and make sure that you're aware of it. Just because the, the, that limit is so high right now doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. Also, the state. So there is not a current California estate tax. However, California wants to impose one. And the, the last time I saw, they want to oppose it at $3.5 million. So it's something to be concerned about and aware of and make sure that it's planned for um, if you're in that range. I would say once you're at about two, 2.5 million, you should really start thinking about planning for that. Um, now this is this is just my opinion. Um, I don't. My crystal ball is broken, but I think with all of the aid that's been going out, both federally and California, that they're both California and federal. They're going to be encouraged to raise more taxes, um, and the estate tax ends up being uh, one that they usually uh, want to impose. So in California has already made it clear before COVID hit that they wanted to do this. So I, I couldn't imagine that it's not going to be in our future sometime soon. All right. So um, another thing to think about and uh, plan for our retirement plans. So you don't want your family to lose half your retirement plans to taxes. If it's not planned well, it's not planned right, that could happen. We had a situation, unfortunately, the client um, that we helped after dad had passed, had um, dad had used a paralegal to help him prepare the trust. And um, in doing so, the retirement plans were not well prepared planned for and it resulted in the kids essentially losing one half just boom off the top in taxes and that's stuff that can be planned around and, and avoided so you've got to got to make sure that you're you're doing things well and not accidentally um, setting it up where your family is going to lose half of your retirement accounts it must be planned for the right right way so some benefits of a comprehensive estate plan is peace of mind, making knowing that it is done. Um, not only is it done, but it's done well, it's done right. It's avoiding court because nothing good happens in court. Remaining in control, right? We decide for ourselves who makes decisions for us. And also we wanna make sure that we minimize costs and delays. Uh, we don't wanna spend too, two, three years, gosh, 34 years for Howard Hughes in probate court. That is just not what we want to do. So um, any, any questions? Does anybody have questions for me? I'm going to open it up. I'm almost done. I probably have about two or three more minutes. So anybody have any questions? There's, there hasn't been any in the chat. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, a lot of times I'm asked, um, I do, I have people asking specific questions. Um, I will, offer um, to everybody who is on our call today. If you want to sit down and talk with me, talk to a member of our legal team, ask your questions. I am happy to provide that to you. Um, I think it's very important. Um, I often see that people don't get it done because they not, they're not sure what to do. They're intimidated to talk to an attorney. Um, they're afraid that it's going to cost 
a ton of money just to talk to an attorney, just to get some, some basic ideas and, and questions answered about what, what their family needs. So to anybody on the call, um, just as a, an appreciation for all that Riverside County Law Library does for our community, I'm offering um, my legal team to answer your questions. So for an individual or family strategy session. During that strategy session, we would talk about a plan to preserve your legacy and keep family harmony, make sure that we plan to protect your property and develop a strategy to minimize any um, taxes because uh, it's it's so very important. Um, let's see how it works is it's a 45 minute either meeting here in our uh, office at Shoop Legal or a Zoom call, whichever you prefer. We're doing a lot of Zoom calls right now, so we're happy to do that as well. During that time, we're going to discuss your specific family situation. We're going to discuss your concerns, your goals, develop a strategy to protect your family and your property, and we'll answer whatever questions you have about your unique situation. All right. So I'm often asked, you know, okay, gosh, how much is it going to cost? Well, usually if you call in for a strategy session, um, it's $450. Like I said, it is absolutely free, no cost to um, the participants for the Riverside County Law Library. Um, so take me, I've made my legal team available. I've actually reserved time specifically to be able to do this for any of the participants to answer any of your questions. Take me up on this offer. Um, it, it, the only thing is I just need to know today if you want to, um, to schedule, just give me and uh, send me a, a message in the chat with your phone number and your email, put your name in there as well. Um, so I know who to contact. Um, what's the catch? No catch really. It's just, you just gotta let me know now. Now, just so that I can open up that time in our schedule. Um, I, I reserve that time for our legal team um, so that they're available to any of the participants to answer whatever your questions. I know it, it can be um, kind of a, um, e if, even if we were in person, you know, it's not the, the right place to ask specific individualized questions um, and ask, you know, all of our, our personal confidential information. So that's why I make this available to be able to answer those questions and talk about your specific situation. I just need to know now if no one's um, interested, there's, there's no obligation. I just like to make that available. That is completely fine. Um, I'll just open up that time back up on our schedule um, to be able to, to see people. So again, all you've got to do is send me a message um, in the chat with your phone number and email so we can contact you. All right. Just give me a, um, a message with that. Uh, it's important that we do plan today so we have peace of mind tomorrow. We want to make sure that we um, have everything set up and planned for. And if you do have any questions, I put my contact information. I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. Any, any other questions? I think I came in right under an hour, so <laughs> hopefully we're doing okay. Uh, you have three minutes. Um, there is a question. It's what's the time frame to pay back debt? Is it four months? Okay, so I think you're talking about in probate. Um, when can, when's the time frame that creditors can um, come back and say, hey, you owe me money? So if that's the case, that is a, um, well, let me answer it a few different ways. Number one, if we're going through probate, we start a probate petition, okay? And we send out notice and we st um, start it with the court. The court then grants that petition, you know, ideally at some point the court generally will grant it and we get what's called letters of administration. Creditors have four months from that date to be able to file a claim with the court to say, hey, you own, this guy owed me money, you gotta pay me. All right. Now there are some other things that we do after that, but that's usually where that four months comes into play. I will also say after someone passes away, it's one year from the date that they pass for creditors to do something about it to um, that's their statute of limitations. This year, statute of limitations are all they're They're just kind of funky because the court shut down. So the statute of limitations got, um, basically it stopped. Gosh, don't quote me on this. It's sometime in, oh, I think it's like August, or not, not August, April 6th. Don't, again, don't quote me. I, I'm going off of my memory. And then it starts back up October 1st. So it's, 
extended a little bit. That one year is extended a little bit because of that. So hopefully that answered the question. If not, answer me, ask me a different way and hopefully I can, I can understand the question so I can answer it. You said that answered it. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. All right, any other questions I can answer? I'm not seeing any come in through the chat. Okay. And I can put, I'll type in your. I'm gonna email. stop sharing. So, okay. Perfect. Well, I am so glad to have had this opportunity. Um, I really, I, I have found that so many, so much of the time we just don't understand how important things are and what happens when we don't um, set some stuff up and plan for ourselves. So I want to make sure that I get good information out there. Um, I, I want to make sure that people know, and then we just, we can make the decisions that we want to make, right? Um, and we're able to make wise choices that way. So I, Jenna, thank you for the opportunity. I truly appreciate being able to share information with people. And I wanted to clarify, um, mm -hmm. because I am sharing the recording out with people who probably, who weren't able to come today, um, and they will hear that you're giving away the, the free consultation. So are you making a designation like it's only to the people that were here live? That is a great question. No, you know what, what I'll do is I'll just, I'll extend it till September 1st. Let us know by September 1st. I had my contact information up. Hopefully they saw it. So if you're listening to the recording, I'll extend it till September 1st. I won't open up that time to anybody. Um, just give us a call. So call our number and let the, but you got to let them know that you're calling for the strategy session with Riverside County uh, Law Library. Okay, so um, my my assistant will will know to make sure that that's way for you. So we'll we'll extend it till September first. Um, and Jenna, you're welcome to put that in your email, you know, to people as well. Um, so we'll extend it till September first. No problem. I completely understand. And can you um, can you send me the the specific login information that you want me to put in the email? Then yeah, absolutely. I'll send that to you. Okay. Yep. So if there are no other questions. It's now 2.01 and I'm not seeing any questions. Some, uh, the person whose question that you answered, they said, thank you. Okay, good. And they said it was very informative and I have to agree. It was very informative. Um, so if there's no other questions, I will, um, we can end the meeting okay. and